Okay, I think we need to uh, get started. So thank you everybody for, for coming to uh, the first uh, colloquium in, I'll call it the modern series of, of colloquiums in, uh, uh, in SCS. Uh, so and ho I'm hoping this will be beginning, the beginning of a, of, a, of a series of these things. Certainly we have the next year planned. And when we're selecting speakers for these, for these, I mean, first of all, I'd like to invite any of you to volunteer yourselves, volunteer your friends, volunteer, I don't want to say your enemies, but volunteer people you think will, will give great talks. But of course, we got, <laughs> we, we're volunteering already. <laughs> um, but of course, the first one is, is special in that it's, it's an inaugural talk. And uh, for that, I think I maximized a function here. And the, maximum, the, the function I, I, I tried to maximize was the person who had published, and I'm not sure I got it right, but I, I, I know I came to, a, at the very least, a very good approximation of the maximum, which is the person who had published with the largest number of people and especially the largest number of people in disparate areas of this, of this school. And one of the motivations here is to bring together people who are, are publishing in, in um, or who are working in different areas in a very large school and just hear what everybody else is doing. So our first speaker today is Keshev. Keshev started with the school in 2003. And I, I must say, it, it, it's scary reading his CV, and it makes me very pleased. Uh, he's an ACM fellow. He's a Canada Research Chair. He's recently the Cisco Systems Research Chair in Smart Grid. Grid. He's also the chair of ACM SIGCOM, which I can appreciate is, is, is a huge task. Uh, he's written over 100 papers. And one of the things that I like is he, he won a Test of Time Award in 2006. And this is, these, are, these are really impressive awards to win because they say that you know, a good decade after the paper was published, this actually has some, has some weight. He's published two textbooks. Um, I, I like the titles. One's Mathematical Foundations of Computer Networking, and one's An Engineering Approach to Computer Networking. So this also, I, I, I like the... Um, the, the, um, the, the spread of this. So uh, it, it really makes me uh, quite, quite happy to introduce Keshet. He's been as a professor at Cornell prior to being, uh, running his own tech startup, prior to, be, prior to being here. And before that, I think he was at and and, and before that at UC Berkeley. So that's all about, that's all I want to say about this, which is, um, and I'd like to thank Keshet for giving our first talk. Uh, thank you all for coming out for this talk. I hope you'll find it uh, uh, inversely proportional to my terror in preparing it. So, <laughs> and thank you, Mark, for uh, putting the colloquium series together and for introducing me. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, what, I call, what we call the Information Systems and Science for Energy. It coincidentally, it's the name of the lab that Catherine Rosenberg and I set up about three and a half years ago. We call it ISS for E. Uh, it's no surprise that uh, there is global warming going on. The IPCC report that came out uh, just about a month ago uh, says warming of the climate system is unequivocal. There's no two ways about it. And perhaps one big reason for that is gasoline combustion. Um, one thing that most people don't realize is that burning one liter of gasoline re releases 2.27 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So in this jug, I have 2.27 kilograms of water. And I'd like you to pass it around and just think to yourself as you, as you hold this. It's not gasoline. It's not gasoline, but each, <laughs> each liter of petroleum you put in your car releases this mass of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, this mass. You might start bicycling to work when you do that. But electricity generation actually produces even more mass, even more carbon than gasoline, even transportation, twice as much according to uh, the IPCC. And so what I'd like to focus on today is not transportation, but actually the electrical grid. And what I started with talking a little bit about today's electricity grid and its characteristics. So today's grid really has three components to it. You know, very broadly speaking, generation of electricity, the transmission of electricity on these power lines that you'll see all across the 401, and distribution, which is the low voltage lines that come to your home. Okay? And the way they fit together is like this. We basically have a power plant over here which produces electricity, and we use transformers to step it up to high voltages because the currents get reduced and losses are I squared R. So the lower the current, the lower the losses. And we send it to long, across long distances up to a few thousand kilometers to substations like you've seen in Fisher-Holman, 
which where they come down to low voltages, they go to your home, they transform yet again to yet low voltages, and it comes to your home. And this is everything you need to know about the grid. Okay, that's all you need to know. It's pretty straightforward. But there are some characteristics about the grid that are worth understanding. So the first one is that it's over-provisioned by design. So on this graph over here, what I'm showing is the daily load profile. It's a typical load profile, and you'll see some more real ones later, where you have some low value, it goes high, and then goes down again. Basically, people don't really use much electricity at night. Okay, that's what's going on over here. However, look at the capacity. The grid has no storage, practically speaking. Almost no storage today. So what you've got to do is, unless you want blackouts, you're going to have to put the capacity of, uh, above the peak. This is like saying that the ring road around us has got to have eight lanes in both directions because once a year during convocation, we have a lot of cars on it. Okay? That's the way the grid is built today. It's kind of weird, but that's the way it is. Right? Because, and, and the reason is because there's not much storage. It's pretty inefficient. Okay? We all know about if you drive through Toronto at night, you'll see lights left on. Everybody leaves the lights on. Okay? They don't really care. And in fact, if the grid is just 5% more efficient, the, it has been computed by the uh, uh, Energy Administration in the, in the United States that it's like 53 million cars being off, taken off the road. In computer systems research, which is my background, if you get a 5% improvement in performance, people just yawn. It's like, yeah, big deal, you know. 5%, it's in the noise. You need, you need to say 20%. Ideally, 100% or a 10x improvement for somebody to actually take notice. Here, 1% and people are dancing in the streets, okay? It's a nice place to go to research in, okay? It's aging, okay? The two things that I want to show this figure, one is that Edison, who would be, if you took him to distribution network and showed him what to do, you know, showed him around, he'd say, yeah, that was no big deal. I'd invented those in 1892. And he'd be right. There was nothing that he couldn't actually figure out about the distribution network just by looking at stuff. But if you took him to a data center, he would kind of wonder what all those wires were, okay? That's one thing that system is pretty much aging all around us. All the infrastructure that's been put into the ground in the in developing, in developed countries between 1950 and 1970 is actually getting to the end of life, okay? In Ontario alone, we're planning to spend about $4 billion on wooden poles just to replace all the transmission poles. Forget about all the transfers and other stuff. Just the poles alone is about $4 billion worth of infrastructure that has to be replaced. So there's a huge change happening because everything is coming into end of life. It's pretty uneven in terms, the grid is pretty uneven. Look at the numbers over here. This is the terawatt hours generated. It doesn't matter what this number means, but basically the total electricity generated in China in 2012, about 4,938 terawatt hours. Actually, it exceeds the US, but look at the per capita. Per capita, it's only 395. It's about, uh, it's quite a bit below this. It's almost a fourth, okay? So if China comes up over here, you can imagine how much more carbon is gonna be generated, okay? And, and China's uh, putting in one coal plant every week. It's building one more coal plant a week. So, it's, uh, so this unevenness reflects the fact that there isn't, uh, that there's going to be more uh, carbon being generated by the grid worldwide. The system is poorly measured. All of us get monthly, uh, bi-monthly bills from the electricity company. Every two months they say this is how much you consumed. Imagine you have a car and you're driving this car all you want. Every time you want to fill gas, you just fill gas as much as you want. They just, you know, and then every two months they say you owe $800. And if you don't pay up, you're going to cut off your gas connection. You're going to, you can't drive your car for the rest of your life. Okay? That's the electricity system for you. Every two months you know what happened and you have no way to attribute what's going on. And the same exact system is true for the utilities. They actually don't know much either. Okay? The way they find out the line is down, typically somebody calls and says, I have no electricity. Oh, yeah, sure, the line must be down. Okay? So it's poorly measured. It's poorly controlled. You know, if I want to take this one single light up there and turn it on, I can't do that. I can't put a header and an address on the electron and say, go to this light. Okay? Everybody on that circuit gets it. So you can't really address electrons. They can address packets. So it's very hard to control. And it's ridiculously cheap. Okay? Imagining, imagine that you're going to, so anywhere to turn the front lights down a little bit, because I'm losing all my uh, slides over here. So imagine that you're bicycling as hard as, hard as you possibly can uphill, okay? Imagine that you're going to do that for an hour, okay? Can you imagine how much work that is, okay? Now imagine I'm going to pay you for that, okay? In, in, in the same way I pay for electricity. So bicycling uphill as hard as you can for an hour, 
And you know, how much would you think I would pay you if I want to pay it electricity units? Ten dollars? Three and a half cents. <laughs> it's ridiculously cheap. Okay, so that's what we pay for electricity around here. Okay. So these characteristics of the grid are contributing to all sorts of problems. Okay. And the foremost among them, as I mentioned, is being the huge carbon footprint. Okay. So it's inefficient, there's a lot of carbon footprint, but there's some technologies coming down the pike, which you probably heard about, I'm going to talk about them, which are changing the grid. So let me start with the first one, it's wind. Okay. Wind energy, wind turbines are really taking off. We're all familiar with the Moore's law hockey stick curve. Here's the hockey stick curve for wind deployment. On the, this line over here shows wind deployment in gigawatts of uh, uh, cumulative deployment in the US. And you can see it's hit about 60 gigawatts, it's equivalent to 60 power plants. And at the same time, the price per gigawatt is nearly monotone, but it's come down to very low, below 10 cents a, a kilowatt hour, okay? 10 cents is what we pay. Actually, wind is about four and a half to five cents a kilowatt hour. So it's actually very cost effective, which is why wind is being deployed like crazy. Same thing is true for solar. In the, well, on the blue line, I'm showing the cost for solar uh, going down pretty fast, 80% decline in the last four years, and the penetration of solar going up. Uh, now four countries have achieved 10 gigawatts of solar penetration each. Japan just achieved in August 10 gigawatts of solar uh, deployment. When I was growing up, I was always told, wind, solar, it's in the future. Well, guess what? The future is now, <laughs> okay? On October 3rd, 2013, just two weeks ago, 60% of the total energy produced in Germany was from wind and solar. That's it. Just wind and solar alone are 60% of all of Germany. Now, Germany is much far, further ahead than the, most other countries in the world. But you know, when you think about it, solar used to be under half a percent or 0.2% of production on every country in the world just about five years ago. Okay? And we've got to 60% just now. So the future is now. Things are really changing in terms of production. Storage is the holy grail of, 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 of things. You'll see in, a minute, in, in, in just about five minutes, you'll see why. But uh, we need storage badly, and there's a lot of money being invested in it. According to this company, Pike Research, about $122 billion of investment is going to be happening in storage research in, in the next uh, few years. Uh, and so many new technologies are coming out. Batteries based on nanotechnology, flywheels. These are not old flywheels, these are things that are spinning super fast in vacuum chambers. Supercapacitors, you can go buy a cordless drill today that uses supercapacitors because they charge very fast, they hold a lot of energy. Compressed air storage, entire can uh, canyons, and ca sorry, entire caverns underground are being filled with compressed air to store energy. So a lot of storage happening here. So that's another technology that's changing besides wind and solar. Electric vehicles are a new technology as well. They spur research in low cost uh, storage technologies and also huge consumers of electricity. If you plug five or six electric cars on the same side of the street in the neighborhood, the local transformer will blow up, okay, just like that. So uh, these are because of huge consumers of electricity. So we need to worry about electric vehicles. This shows a Nissan Leaf, and each of these lunchbox little things is, is a lithium-ion battery. Uh, as you can see, there's no, there's no engine, right? The motors are in the wheels, and this is, this is all battery packs all over the place. There is going to be pervasive sensing, whether you like it or not. This amazing device, I'm going to tell you what all it does, and then I'll tell you how big it is. This has two processors on it. It has a solar cell, it has a battery to charge from the solar cell. It has radio communication, it has a temperature sensor, and it has a camera, 96 bits and 96 bits. And the whole package is the size of a grain of salt, one millimeter cube. <laughs> okay, it's made in the, it's called the Michigan Micro Mode. It's being made by a professor at the university there. But these specs are self-powered form radio links with each other and can sense the temperature in your house. Right now, if you want to know the temperature in your house, you got one thermostat sitting near the kitchen somewhere, all right? And if you, if you put the oven on, the rest of the house becomes cold. With these guys, you can put a thousand in your home for a couple of bucks, okay? That's what's happening with sensing. Same is true for computation. This little microcontroller, the KLO2 microcontroller from Freescale Electronics uh, is 1.9 millimeters by two millimeters, okay? 
It's a full-fledged controller. It doesn't have radio on it, but it's a full-fledged controller. So computation, you can imagine being everywhere. The, the use case for this is actually almost unbelievable. It's meant to be swallowed. Okay? It's for measuring stuff inside your body. You're supposed to swallow it in a pill. Okay. And pervasive communication. You know? This is a graph of a company called Trillion. These are the guys who make the smart meters in Ontario. And their vision is communication inside the home, between homes, to your uh, electrical transmission poles, to headquarters, basically communications everywhere. Okay? So you can sense everything. You can communicate all of that. You can do computation on it. All right? And then you can, you can control stuff, because you also have things like these controllers. This is the Control 4 device, which allows you to control a whole bunch of stuff in your home. Okay. So this is what's coming. These are the technologies, storage, renewables, pervasive computation, and communication, which is going to bring what people call the smart grid. On the left-hand side, I have what the current grid is. I talked about those features a bit, a, a bit earlier. It's centralized, but with solar panels and wind farms all over the way, it becomes decentralized. The current grid has little to no storage, but if all those billions of dollars aren't all being wasted, you're going to have a lot more storage. The current grid is high carbon, but we, want, we believe that because solar and wind are very, very low carbon footprint, we'll have a low carbon LXC generation. It's poorly measured. With pervasive sensing, we should get something that's sensing rich. We have very little control right now. We can put on every light bulb, we can put a tiny chip, a sensor on it, and we can send packets to that little chip and say, turn the light bulb on and off. So I can make electrons addressable if I put a wireless controller on them. So every single bulb here could be individually controlled if you wanted to. The old grid is ossified. The new one is supposed to be flexible. The old grid is very inefficient. We hope that the new grid is energy frugal. Okay? We don't want to uh, not use energy. We want to be clever about using it. OK, so we're done. <laughs> okay? We've got all these new technologies. All the old stuff is done. We can all go home. right? But then I, that gives me a lot more time for the rest of the stock. So. <laughs> But we are not done. Maybe not. There are some challenges. Let me talk about those for a minute. So here is a beautiful graph. I told my wife this is the prettiest graph I've seen in a while. And she said, I haven't seen pretty things in a long time, maybe. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you what it is. The red over here is 30 days of demand in Germany. Okay? The yellow is the solar output over 30 days from in Germany. And the blue is wind. So you see right away that the demand curves which is the amount of demand as produced by consumers, is pretty stable. You, know, you kind of know what it is. In fact, it's true. You can predict the demand for the next day with about only 2% error without, without too much trouble. The solar depends on how cloudy it is, but it goes up and down at night. There's no sun. That's why you need storage. You've got to put it somewhere to meet the demand at night. And wind, well, who knows? You know, who knows which way the wind blows or how much it blows? The problem is you've got to match demand and supply. How do you do that? You know, just because I've got lots and lots of solar panels doesn't help me at all at night. And just because I have a lot of wind farms doesn't help me at all. There was a case in Texas where the wind died on for two full weeks, and there was a big problem. So let's use storage. But storage is expensive. If I were to consume one kilowatt hour, it only cost me 10 cents, as I mentioned. On the other hand, if I had to store it, it cost me $450 to buy the batteries to store it. So it's 4,500 times more expensive to store it than to spend it. Okay? It's kind of a very, very off balance right now. You have lots of generators, lots of so solar panels. This shows you the number of solar panels in the U US over the last 10 years. And you can see they have 300,000 panels. It's like having a controller having to control 300,000 generators. And this is actually going to the millions. So imagine a controller, the IESO, a controller in Ontario, deals with 250 generators right now. And you have to go and say, by the way, five years from now, you're going to deal with 25 million generators. That's the problem they have to face. It's a scaling problem. It's very difficult. And moreover, the control actually has to happen over many time scales. I don't mean to read all of these things, but let you look at the x-axis. The fastest time scale of control in the, in the grid is at a microsecond, and the slowest time scale is over decades, about 10 to the 9 second, seconds. We have 15 orders of magnitude in control. Okay? And this is a challenging problem by any means. The communication is also very complex. I, I can't even show you the whole thing. This is called the grid blocks diagram. It's from Cisco. And it shows their vision of the communication network for the smart grid. And it's huge. There's all sorts of stuff going on. It's complex. Okay, figuring out what works, how to build it, we really don't have answers there. 
Consumers have no incentive to save. Remember the bicycling, I told you, you're going to pedal all you want, it's going to be going to cost three and a half cents. Well, if I did all the energy saving measures, you know, I ran my dryer at the right times, I did everything, turned off all the lights, I'm going to save about 10 to 15 percent on my bill, about $10 a month. It's basically not worth doing. Okay? After I started doing research on this, I stopped telling my wife to not run the dryer during the day because it saves about 0.5 cents. It's not worth arguing about. Okay? Energy is so cheap, we have no incentive to do anything right now. And the same is true for utilities. Think about it. If I'm Waterloo North Hydro, for every kilowatt hour that my customer doesn't spend, I get less money. Why would I want to tell my customers not to spend the money on my product? Right? So if I'm a utility, I want to tell customers, spend more. Use more electricity. Turn on all the lights and go away on vacation as long as you possibly can. Forget about the baseboard heater. Turn that up too, because guess what? Every thing you spend makes more profit for me. So they have no incentive to save. It's a pr few problems to worry about. <laughs> we aren't quite done yet. <laughs> so what do we do? Right? What we did was about three and a half years ago, Catherine Rosenberg, who unfortunately can't be here today, she's an ECE, uh, she and I decided to start this lab, we call it ISS4E, and this is the mission we came up with, to use information systems and science, which is a waffly way of saying computer science and electrical engineering, but we didn't want to say that, uh, to increase the efficiency and reduce the carbon footprint of energy systems. That's basically our mission, and we have a nice logo that goes with it. And we came up with three ideas, or three approaches of how to do research in this space, considering that we are coming from sort of an ECE and CS background. The first one is, is, what, is what we call exploiting the equivalency between the grid and the internet. And we were the first people to actually come up with this idea. Um, we also do what's called problem-oriented research. You have a problem, it's sort of a classic thing. You have a problem, you find a solution, you see how well it did. And then this newer thing, which we call data-driven research, which is basically given a data set, what questions can you answer? Power engineers today, of course, are interested in the smart grid, but by and large, they haven't done this because they don't know much about the internet. And they haven't done this because they haven't had access to data, right? Because there wasn't much measurement going on. And of course, they do do this, but these two things are novel. So in fact, those are some of the contributions. What I'm going to do for the remaining time I have is to give you a brief idea of what research looks like, and then give you a taste of some of the results that we've come up with in the last uh, three years or so. So the first one says the grid looks like the internet. And you know, I just to kind of prove by hand waving, on the left hand side, I have the number of IP endpoints in the in EOS, and here I have the grid, and they sort of look the same. But let's be a bit more technical than that. We can actually show that uh, these equivalencies are pretty much true. Electrons look like bits. The load, that is what you plug into electrical power point, looks like a source. So actually, what we can think of is that the grid is a place where uh, the sources, or the loads, are generating negative packets, which kind of, okay, because going the wrong, op wrong opposite direction. Communication links look like transmission lines. Battery and energy storage look like buffers. Demand response, which means reduce the demand because in response to a con congestion signal, it's just like congestion control. Uh, transmission network looks like a tier one ISP. Distribution network looks like a tier two or three ISP. And a variable generator looks like a variable bitrate source. So these equivalencies uh, are actually true, and we've used these in much of our work. Just to give you an example of this, let's look at this specific thing called the equivalence theorem. This is work I did with uh, Omid Arzakanian, who's my student and sitting somewhere here, and, and Catherine Rosenberg. And we consider two systems. On the left-hand side, I have a bunch of loads. These are things plugged into power points. And we have a transformer supplying them. But whenever the transformer is overloaded, it can uh, underload it, it can put stuff in storage. Whenever it's overloaded, it gets stuff out of storage. Okay? This, and we compare it to a system where you have a bunch of sources and they try to send data on the link over here. Whenever the link is overloaded, you put it in the buffer. Whenever the server has capacity, you drain the buffer. So this is a classical networking system. And this one is sort of a, a, a storage system. And what we found, we can prove, is that every trajectory in terms of buffer occupancy on here corresponds to trajectory over there in the storage occupancy. Okay? And what this means is that we can actually use something called teletraffic theory, which is the de theory developed over here to study the system over here. And so this is a very beautiful equivalence. What this means is you can take all the math we've developed over the last 25 years in teletraffic theory and just apply it to the, uh, to the grid. So here's an example of a result of that. 
So on this graph, on the x-axis, I'm showing sort of the number of homes. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the transformer size we need to serve those homes, because each home has some typical load profile. OK, so these dashed lines over here are transformer size guidelines from Hydro One. So Hydro One has used the last 80 years of field experience to say, OK, if you have so many homes, put a transformer this size. You have these many homes, put this size, and so on. So that's, those are their guidelines. What we did was we measured the home loads using some of our own measuring equipment. And then we plugged that into teletraffic theory. And we came up with this blue graph over here that said, these are our guidelines. And we were actually really surprised to see that we could actually hit all of those guidelines almost exactly on the nose, okay? which is from theory, from teletraffic theory. So it kind of gave us a lot of, uh, we were really pleased to see this because we did this independently. Now, you'd say, what's the point? You, know, you already have these guidelines. Well, the nice thing about theory is that we can also now quantify the impact of storage. You can see if you put some storage, you can actually make the transformer size smaller. How much smaller? Well, we can quantify that. That's something Hydro One just cannot do. So that, this is uh, one thing that we can do. A second thing we've done is to look at uh, electric vehicle charging. Remember what I said, if you have a bunch of cars parked and they're all on the same side of the street and they go to local transformer, which is shown over here, that transformer will get overloaded and it can actually uh, blow up. Right? So what we want to do is we want to reduce the load of these cars so that this doesn't blow up. And this is what we call it as congestion in the internet. We can use, what happens in the internet is whenever you're sending too much from a source, remember electrons are negative bits, when you send too much source from a source into this node over here, the node will start dropping packets, which is interpreted as congestion, and the source will reduce its rate. And this is what's called additive increase, multiplic multiplicative decrease control. So anyone of you who's taken a course in computer networking knows what that is. Well, you can use the exact same technique for charging cars, okay? So we don't actually use AMD, we use a, a, a variant of it, but we can actually show that we can build a solution for charging vehicles pretending that they are sources, like TCP sources, and we can get a solution that's both fair and efficient in its allocation of charging. So again, this comes straight from the equivalence. But perhaps the greatest, uh, 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 the most recent work, which I think is the greatest impact, hopefully, uh, of, uh, from the equivalence work is, is to try and match this intrinsic and huge problem of matching supply and demand. So remember what I said earlier, you have this demand, you have this variable supply, how do you match the two? Well, what you have to do is to put storage in. So what you do is you take the storage and you soak up the wind and the solar whenever the demand is low, and then whenever the demand is high, you release it. So you have to put storage in, but you have to put in the least amount of storage that you possibly can. To understand this, consider the rain barrel model of the internet, <laughs> okay? So here is what's happening. I have a rain barrel, and in this rain barrel, I have uncontrolled stochastic input, which is rain, right? I don't know what it's going to rain like, just like I don't know how sunny it's going to be. And here is a gardener who's going to turn the faucet to drain the to drain the uh, rain barrel, again, it's uncontrolled stochastic output, okay? And I have a size over here, which as the rain barrel cannot have more than this much water, or less than this much. And what we want to do is to compute the following question. What barrel size should we have such that with high probability, we don't have an overflow or an underflow of the barrel, okay? So actually, it's not an easy question to answer, okay? Uh, but let's see how we can do it. So one approach that has been tried in the computer networking community, again, for buffers, not for rain barrels, is to use an idea of what's called envelopes. So this is what envelope looks like. We say that the sum of the input, the cumulative input, is more than some lower envelope and less than some upper envelope. And these envelopes are computed from trajectories. So you have some past history, and you compute it, and you believe that the future looks like the past. And in the same way, we have an output lower and upper envelope. Okay? We can go one step further. We can make the envelope stochastic. We can say, for example, that the probability that the sum of the input minus the lower envelope exceeds some value x exponentially decreases with the x. So the larger x is, the smaller it gets. In fact, this is only two equations in my slides, so you should hopefully understand them. Uh, so this is a stochastic envelope. So this lower envelope, I haven't told you what it is, but basically it says that with very high probability, I'm going to not exceed it uh, uh, by, by, by this x over here, okay? And the same thing is true for the upper envelope minus the input. So these are upper and lower stochastic envelopes on the generation. And in the same way, I can compute stochastic upper and lower envelopes on the output. And if I do that, 
Then I can use what's called stochastic network calculus. This is now you know, beyond my capability. Luckily, luckily, I have a postdoc with Yashar Gyasi who understands this stuff. He's one of 10 people in the world who understand this, not including me. And what we do is in this work is we take these, the buffer size and the service and tra traffic input and output envelopes, and we can tell what's the probability of traffic loss, what's the probability of overflow of a buffer. And using the equivalence that was shown by Stephen Lowe and others uh, some years back uh, for this system, we can take the battery size and demand and source envelopes, use the same analysis, and find the probability that we will not be able to supply a load from the battery. Remember, I have the, have the solar coming in. I got to put the battery. What's the probability that I can't meet the demand? That's the loss of power. And moreover, if I have battery filling up, then I got to waste power. I can also just figure out how much power I'm going to waste because the battery is filled up. These two things we can do uh, using stochastic network calculus analysis. And using this, we've been able to come up with a series of papers which allow us to minimize the storage size to smooth solar and wind sources. We can compute what's the optimal participation of a solar or wind farm in the day ahead market for energy. Uh, we can model imperfect storage devices. We can also look at optimal op operational diesel generators for dealing with power cuts in developing countries. So all of these seemingly disparate uh, ideas actually all flow from this idea of upper and lower stochastic envelopes on, on storage systems. So, and, and all that comes from the equivalent. So we find it a very fruitful way of doing things. The second approach we have is what you call problem-oriented research. And this is the classic approach. We have problem formulation, typically increase efficiency, reduce carbon footprint. That's our mission. We do some modeling using some of these uh, techniques, optimization, queuing theory, network calculus, and so on. We do some analysis, again, using these theories. We design something. In doing the design, we use new technologies, right? And then we do the implementation evaluation. To give a sense of what this might look like, I'm going to show you some work that we did, uh, with, I did with my student, uh, Peter Gao, who's now a uh, grad student at Berkeley. It was his master's thesis work. And this is on what's called smart personal thermal comfort system. Our idea is simple. We want to reduce building energy use uh, by using fine-grained thermal control of individual offices. And the way it works is like this. You know, let's say we have a building. And what we do is we just keep the most of the building area relatively cool. Like instead of heating it to 23 degrees like we do today, we heat it to, let's say, 19 or 20 degrees okay? in, in, this, in, in, in winter. And then individual offices could be heated more. Okay? And this will save energy overall because you have la large spaces that aren't going to be heated at all or not heated to the same level as they are today. So our idea is to use a mathematical model for comfort. So I want to know sort of mathematically how comfortable you are. And when you're occupied, I want to make sure that you're comfortable at the minimum acceptable level. And then you off, when you, when you bake and you do miss bake and turn the heating off. And also I want to preheat it. So on this, on this chart, I'm showing on the x-axis the time of the day, on the y-axis the temperature, which is equivalent to comfort for most purposes. And you know, this person, the, the, uh, this is actually my occupancy. So I came into work at around 9 o'clock. But the system started heating already before I came, so that it was nice and warm. And when I went for lunch, it went away. And it started cooling before I left, because I knew it was going to leave, OK? Because it was going to preheat and precool based on occupancy prediction. And then the actual heating, we want to use optimal control, something called optimal model predictive control. So, the new technology we brought here was mathematical determination or automatic determination of your comfort level. And to do this, we actually built this. We built uh, several of these. And I'm not going to pass these around. A bit fragile. But what it is is uh, a Microsoft Connect over here. And then on top of it is this uh, two stepper motors that control the uh, rotation and going up and down. And that points this infrared camera, this five degree camera, at the occupant all the time. So wherever you go, it keeps following you. What it measures is the temperature of the surface of your clothing. Okay? Why it does that is because the closer your clothing temperature is to the air temperature, which is measured by this sensor over here, the more clothes you're wearing. Ideally, if you're infinitely insulated, then the surface of your clothing is going to be the same as the air temperature. On the other hand, if you're naked, your surface temperature is going to be 34 degrees, which is almost surely hotter than anything in the air. Okay? So we know whether you're naked or not. Okay? 
using this information and using the measurement over here, which is the air temperature, the air velocity, et cetera, we can plug it into an equation called Fanger's equation. And we can tell you, we can determine how comfortable you are. And if you're not comfortable enough, we're going to turn up the heat. And if you're comfortable, we can turn off the heat. How well did it do? So here is a chart showing on the x-axis the clothing level estimated by an expert, and the y-axis the clothing level estimated by, the, by this system over here. And we were pretty good. You know, we got a, a root mean squared error of about 0.1 and the correlation of 0.92. So it's never been done before. Nobody has been able to automatically determine the comfort level of a human being using this kind of system ever before. We just built it out of Arduinos and uh, you know, stuff off the net, basically. Uh, the other thing we did was to do occupancy prediction using data mining. For this, we actually stole or used a technique that was developed at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. And what we do is to look at uh, around, let's say, at 11 o'clock, I want to know what the future occupancy pattern is likely to be at. I look at what the pattern was today, and I see what other days does it look like. And they say, in the past, it looked like this. I take the average, and I say, well, there's zero, the zero probability of being uh, occupying, occupying this value, 0.3 probability here. And certainly, they're going to occupy here, because in all the past, we did that. So if you're doing kind of a naive data mining approach and still getting pretty good results, the beauty of this is that it works whether or not it's Christmas or Labor Day or Thanksgiving. You don't have to know this weekend or weekday. It works for any day because you're looking at the past history. Of course, the bad thing is that during the first part of the day, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. But it gets better and better for the rest of the day. So it's not necessarily the best thing, but it's a reasonable thing to do and something that hasn't really been done before. How well did it work? I'm going to show you a comparison of five schemes over here. On the x-axis, I have the amount of discomfort. And the y-axis is the energy. And obviously, the more energy you spend, the less, the less discomfort you have. So this line over here shows the most energy spent. And it's in the fixed schedule. That means you turn it on all the time. All right? You turn the heater on all the time. You get the most comfort. The schedule one says turn it on only when somebody's uh, uh, from 9 to 5, basically. So you reduce the energy, but the discomfort goes up because you make a mistake when somebody, you make an error in prediction. You can reduce the energy even further and increase the discomfort even further with the reactive that says only when, when somebody's present, then react. Because, and, and, and we can reduce the discomfort and keep the energy the same by reacting and using what we call the predictive uh, personal vote, which is, I won't get into what that is, but basically it's a personalized comfort metric. And then the optimal scheme, which I talked about, actually allows us to increase energy slightly and reduce the discomfort quite a bit. So um, the details aren't important. The thing that is important is that we can actually do something non-trivial and interesting with regard to building heat just from off-the-shelf stuff and a bit of math. Okay, So that's a taste of what it is like to do problem-oriented research. I'm going to talk, take a minute to talk about what I call data-driven research. Here, the approach and the results are both not what you might think otherwise. So here, we start with the data set, which is hard to get. And we formulate a problem that we can actually solve using the data set. And we do some analysis using mostly machine learning, data mining, dig data analytics, things like that, and get insights into it. And to give you an example of this, I want to show you the following problem. Remember I said that the system is overcapacitated. Uh, we have to provision at the peak. We'd rather have the provision at the average. Or maybe another way of saying is we'd like the demand curve to have a low peak to average ratio. The peak to average ratio should be close to 1. What we'd like to do, therefore, is to move the peak down here. And the way we do it is using new technology, which is smart meters. And about 5 million of these have been installed all over Ontario at great expense. I should add. So the idea is that you have this time of use pricing. This is a typical time of use pricing. This is in summer, where from midnight to 7 AM, you're what's called off-peak. Then you have mid-peak, and you have peak. And the idea is that the load is peaking between 11 AM and 5 PM. The prices are higher, so you're going to shift your load. And therefore, it's going to reduce the peak, and the peak to average ratio is going down. So OK, straightforward. Can we? We see, here's the questions we want to answer. Now, if you all know that we actually have summer and winter pricing, and the summer and printer, printer rates last for six months each, is two the right number of seasons? Is six months the right number of duration of each season? Should they start, do they end, start in the right times? Because right now they start on May 1st until November 1st. Do the peak times correspond to actually load peaks? And does the scheme actually even reduce the peak loads? Okay, I mean, sort of naive questions. And you would think that the people who put this scheme into place and spent about, I don't know, half a billion dollars on it, would have the answers. And the answers are, well, 
First, let's look at the data set. We have the aggregate hourly energy load. You can go download this from the IESO. And this is a typical load profile for two weeks. This is shown for the first week and the second week. So you can see in the weekends it goes down, the weekdays is high, and then it goes up and down. The base is not zero. The height is okay. And here are the answers. Okay. Uh, we were sort of surprised, but depending on how cynical you are, you may or may not be surprised. Okay. Uh, we have a better scheme, uh, and basically we said there should be four seasons. Kind of makes sense. We live in a place with four seasons, but should there be two seasons for time of use? These are the typical load profiles for this over here, and these are the uh, optimal uh, times of day when you have time of use pricing. This is work I did with uh, two of my students, uh, Elnaz Rezai and uh, Damola Depetu, who are sitting here somewhere, and Dan Lazot, who is uh, our machine learning guru here, and they were actually, this is a course project. Uh, incidentally, uh, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario has finally kind of heard about this, and so I'm in discussion with him right now to see if we can implement this. So if your time of use price change in Ontario, some of it may be because of this work. So that's not bad. Okay, there are many other data sets we have. I'm not going to talk, go through any of those in great detail, but we have water data sets and extra data sets from thousands of homes and many appliances and so on. So. Uh, we are just getting started on this data set analytics, and I'm working with the Lukash Golab, who's in management sciences and analyzing some of these things. OK, so in the last little bit, I want to do some reflections about the energy research area. This was a new research area for me three years ago. Uh, at that time, I was, uh, really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and you know, I think there are a bunch of pros. It's a rapidly growing research area with many open problems. I'll show you a few in the next slide. There's a lot of industry interest and support. You know, people are willing to actually give money for supporting this. The students are motivated. I've been delighted with the level at which the students really want to work in this area. And there's a potential for impact, for example, changing the time of use pricing. On the other hand, you have to learn a few more concepts. There are many entrenched in sense, interests that don't want to see change. It's difficult to obtain data. It's almost impossible to do field trials. You can't really deploy these things very easily. There are many problems. I'm going to talk about just one, which I find very interesting, which is non-cash incentive design for consumers. We have to give consumers something other than money to make them change behavior. I don't know what it is, but we want to find out. There are many other problems. And if you look at the slides later, you'll see them. So if you're interested, uh, you should join our ISS Furry mailing list. I seem to have left out the website. It's issfurry.ca. It's kind of straightforward, issfurry.ca. If you go there, you can sign up for our mailing list. We have a seminar series. I took the liberty of making this the first seminar in the ISS for seminar series as well. So I got a double inaugural over here. Uh, but next week, we have a Professor Pascal Van Hentendrick, who is at NICTA in Australia. He actually was a very, very well-known person in AI and optimization, who's going to speak in this series so a week from today. And our weekly group meetings are uh, on Wednesdays, 10.30 to 11.30, 13.31. You can get free food, so you know, show up for that. So I want to conclude by saying uh, technology is changing the grid. Computer science has a role to play over here, and there's a lot of opportunities for interesting and impactful research. And all this work would not have been possible without a lot of help from a lot of people. I want to really acknowledge the ISS for your faculty. I mentioned Catherine before. She's a co-director here. There are six faculty members who are from three different faculties. So Ian Rowlands, who's sitting over there, is from the environment. Uh, Lukash and, uh, is from management sciences. Uh, so that's Catherine from ECE and the rest of computer science. And in recently, in just last one year, I believe, these are the co-authors on the papers you've written. So this is just from one year of co-authoring. We have a lot of students right now. Last count, we have 20 students in the group. Uh, and these are some of them. And without them, of course, nothing's going to happen. WISE has been an uh, amazing resource. It's a Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy, about 90 faculty, about 450 uh, grad students across. The, uh, and it's led by Professor Nathwani in civil engineering. Uh, Tracy Forrest, who's the director, has been able to get us lots of data sets. I don't have to travel anywhere to talk to companies. She brings them here. It's amazing. You can just sit here, and everybody comes here to talk to us. And Professor Claudia Kanzaris and Kankar Bhattacharya and EC, he have been, who work in power systems, have been essentially uh, guiding Catherine and me uh, every step along the way, you know, making sure we don't make stupid mistakes. So it's been really, really useful to have them with us. We've been funded by NSERC, uh, CFI, the CRC, the province of Ontario, and even the European Union has thrown in some money. <laughs> and a bunch of corporate sponsors. Uh, 
I, I'm quite thankful for Cisco for sponsoring my research chair, but we also received money from Hydro One, Microsoft, IBM. And I'll end with uh, my pet project. I'm so delighted to be able to do this. We want to build a fleet of electric bicycles and uh, run them, measure them, measure the people who are using them. And I think the number of projects you can do with this is going to be a, a lot of very interesting results are going to come out because I can't afford to buy 20 cars, but I can afford to buy 20 bikes. They only cost $1,000 each. And so uh, with this, I'll end, and I think we have time for a few questions. Okay, thank you. So we do have time for a few questions. Yeah. So you said early on that your no longer trying to shift your prior use to the off-peak hours. And then at the end, you said, oh, but we have this new off-peak system that will, your last question was, does this actually influence people's behavior? So why do you think your new system will influence behavior when you open it? Yeah, so the question is, uh, if I'm not willing to change my dryer use, why should this new system affect everybody else's use? Uh, Electricity is cheap, people are cheaper. <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. Uh, uh, despite the fact that electricity is cheap, uh, commercial interests and industry certainly pay a lot of attention to it. The bills are very high. So individuals may not, but commercial industry do uh, have a big, uh, even in individuals, you know, it's like, okay, if I'm saying half cent here and a half cent there, it all adds up, you know. But uh, I, also, I happen to know what it costs. Most people don't. And if they don't know what it costs, they actually change the behavior. Once they figure out what it actually costs, then they say, forget it. So we should keep people in the dark. I'll turn the lights on. Yeah. Ian, what was it? I don't know what these ratios are, but suppose the heat dryer were free yeah. at night. What would the saving be? So four, ten cents? Well, so a dryer consumes about 1,500 watts. And you're paying about 11 cents a kilowatt hour by day, about between six and eight kilowatt, uh, eight oh, cents a kilowatt. Eleven in the day. Eleven in the day and six and a half by night. That's it. Changes every six months. They change the rates on you. So the differential is about five cents, and you well, run it for. A, say cents. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, not. <laughs> we actually pay Quebec to take electricity away from us every night, and then we pay them again to bring it back to us every morning, because uh, our nuclear plants can't be turned off. So they, they make money twice. That's why they have free kindergarten. <laughs> or free childcare, whatever. Yes? Uh, could you repeat the question? OK, the question is, what, do, what can I divulge about the rate of windmill growth in Ontario? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I can't divulge anything because I don't know anything about it. Uh, I know the government has put together plans for developing certain regions, and that uh, you know there's a lot of outcry because it kills birds. And I have a chart on that. I thought you might be interested in this. What kills birds? Uh, wind turbines, according to Environment Canada, according to study, actually a special issue of the Journal of Aviation uh, came out recently. You can see the numbers. The best way to remove uh, uh, threats to birds is to kill off all the cats. <laughs> the 196 million birds killed a year by cats corresponding to 16. So if you kill off a few cats, you can have lots of turbines. <laughs> yeah. How much of what is a cultural problem? What, how much is what is it? Uh, okay. okay, so the question is, how much of energy inefficiency is due to culture, and how much of it is due to technology? Um, I think that uh, these are sort of intertwined, actually. The culture uh, in North America is to waste energy because it's cheap, right? When uh, you raise the rates, as happened in Germany recently, uh, their rates went up by a factor of four because of the deployment of solar and wind, roughly speaking, a factor of four. They've been very concerned about it. Uh, there's a New York Times article about how pensioners are reducing their light bulbs to a single light bulb because they don't want to pay the energy fees. So 
culture which used to be you know, freely spending has been changed because of pricing. But you have to take a big push. You know, we can't just go from 10 cents to 15 cents. You go to 10 cents to a dollar, okay? And then everything changes right away. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of, and, and the technology of e efficiency right now is not there, right? I mean, you have these big buildings and the janitors cleaning one building, they turn on all the lights because they don't have individual control of lights. So, you know, as we get more pervasive control and communication, I believe that the technology will allow a change in culture where you don't lose too much on comfort, but you, you reduce energy use. So that's the trade-off. We want to keep the comfort level the same and decrease the energy rather than reducing the comfort level. So that's the, the holy grail of Vic, yeah. So um, I sense in a lot of our problems that are coming to a breaking point, a tendency to blame the user. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering if you've detected any willingness amongst the utilities to do things like uh, lower the peaks by controlling when things happen. So when I turn my dryer knob on, I don't really care if the clothes start drying right now or in 15 minutes. And I know in, I think it was 2006, when Toronto was close to Brownhead, they actually were able to control the, which, which was in the summer, by the way, which is so weird that we live in Canada with the electrical peaks in the summer. Um, they were able to turn on air conditioning in large companies factories or something uh, and kind of balance when they were on. So they, they turn them off on something like a 15 minute period out of each hour. Do you sense, with all these sensors, with all this control ability, do you sense a willingness on their part to take responsibility for smoothing out the peaks by doing things automatically for us instead of Okay, okay, so le let me repeat the question and I'll summarize it by saying that do, do I think that the generators or utilities would be willing to do the load shaping on our behalf instead of forcing consumers to do all the work? Um, it, it kind of depends on the jurisdiction, okay? In those jurisdictions where you have disaggregation, where the local utilities are different from the generators, the, 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 the negative of the speak to average thing is you've got to build new generators, right? But Waterloo North Hydro is not building generators. They're just buying whatever comes from transmission. The Waterloo North Hydro has zero incentive to electrocute you to reduce or to demand shifting. The only reason they're doing time of use is because IES has a gun to their, to their head that says you must do you know, time of use pricing, otherwise they wouldn't do it, right? They're doing a kicking and screaming. So in this jurisdiction, it actually doesn't really make much sense. But if you go to BC, British Columbia, BC Hydro is integrated utility all the way. In that jurisdiction, it does make sense for the utility to take some load, uh, uh, some attempted at load shaping. So the one of the big things they're doing is to actually contract with uh, startup companies, a company called Enbala, which aggregates together water sewage plant treatments, uh, water sewage plants, right? The uh, sewage treatment plants. Uh, these are plants that use a lot of electricity for pumping water. And if you take like 10 of these plants in 10 municipalities, you can actually choose when to pump water. Okay. So controlling air conditioning is a small amount, you can, but if you control the sewage plants, it controls a large amount, and they're actually selling this variability in control as a way to shape the peak, and they make money off of that in, in what's called the regulation market. So these kinds of innovations are happening. I, I don't have time to talk about them at all. I'm just giving like a very high level bird's, view, bird's eye view, but it's true that uh, utilities are very keen to avoid spending more money on generation, because putting in a generator today, if you want to build nuclear, it takes 30 years. If you're doing natural gas, it's the fastest, it's about five years. I have to predict the demand five years from now, I've got to get the loan to build it out right now. And if you can avoid that, that's a big deal. And so they have every incentive and they're vertically integrated to avoid that. Okay, now, I hate to cut off questioning, but we're going to have to move next door where there's food and beer and wine and juice and all these kinds of things and we can continue discussion. So please, please go next door. Now, I want to thank Kesha for a great talk. Thank you. I want to thank the school for organizing a great talk, and I want to thank uh, Mitzi and Jackie and Jean and Audiovisual for uh, supporting a great talk. So I hope to see you next door.